As we shift over into the Kestrel side, obviously we're, we're really excited about this and uh, the, the main announcement there that we're delighted to make is that we've selected the Honeywell 331-14 engine uh, for the airplane. Those of you that we've talked to over the last 12 months about where do we think this airplane's going, you'll recall conversations that we've had about what's the right target performance level for the airplane for the market. In that question is engine selection. Do we go for a lower cost engine and a lower cost airplane and a lower performance point, or do we go for the higher cost, higher performance, let's make this thing a real screamer? But it's a debate that you have to have from a business point of view, from an engineering point of view, and to look at what's the right place to enter this market. And as you would expect, there's an objective engineering way that this gets done, where you look at installation, installed horsepower, and the performance, and the weight, and the CG, and all those kinds of things. It's all very reasonable. It's all very logical. Um, I kind of find it interesting. Some people find it boring. But you know, there's that process. Then there's an in-between phase, which is much more subjective, which is about the user aspects of the engine. And this can include things like maintenance cost and longevity. It includes things like support on the engine, but it also includes things like throttle response and how does the pilot work with it. It can't be that we sell airplanes to people who are only good enough to not do the least little thing wrong. We've got to make airplanes easier. And in this case, what we've got with the Honeywell engine is a much more robust system to protect the, <laughs> think how this sounds, protect the engine from the pilot. So that what we've got is a more user-friendly system. So engineering parameters, horsepower, weight, and so on operational side, whether it's the TBO and so on. And then the third part of the selection really did just come down to the partnership. And we've really enjoyed working with the team from Honeywell. They've been absolutely fantastic in terms of being responsive, answering questions, coming up to visit, beating ideas back and forth. So that in the end, all things being equal, and they never are all equal, but all these things being equal, we selected the Honeywell engine because we felt in Honeywell we had the partner that was going to make sure that this was a successful program. And having a great big uncle like that is always helpful, but uh, fantastic support and we appreciate it. Avidyne is the brand of choice for pilots who want innovative, easy to use avionics. And the new IFD 540 GPS Navcom sets a new standard for simplicity in communication and LPV navigation. As a slide-in replacement for existing 530 series navigators, and with a highly intuitive touchscreen control, the IFD 540 makes it much easier to access the information you want when you want it, reducing head downtime and making flying more enjoyable. Finally, you have a choice, and the choice is easy. Avidyne. With the decision on engine, weight, horsepower, performance, CG, wing placement, aerodynamics, and so on, we now get into sort of the rest of the, the, the plan. I've told you guys this and people would expect me to say nothing else, but I can't tell you how excited that I am about this airplane. It's been fun having all of those details come together and see what it's going to be for the customers. You know, we design airplanes for missions and we think customers ought to think about the mission that they have before they decide on their airplane. But then what you also have is the other side of your brain, thinking about mission dream, if you will. Missions expand with the capability that are offered by products. Again, whether it's because it's easier to use or because it's higher performance or, or whatever that parameter is. And we're really excited about where the mission goes on this airplane. As part of that mission, what we say over and over, what you'll see in print, it's to carry a large load, a long distance, at high speed, in and out of short runways. So that drives a lot of the design in terms of, okay, if we're gonna have a big load, you need to have the volume to fit this space. So if you haven't been out, please come out. If you have been out, you'll have noticed that the mock-up that's on display is what we now expect to be the final outer mold line. That is the fuselage that will be produced. The interior stuff can still end up changing, but the outside shape is now set. A lot of volume. We've increased the size of the baggage area significantly, and I've forgotten the number already, but 36 cubic feet, good. As we've flown the prototype around, one of the things you notice, we'll say, well, we've got six seats here, but we haven't got enough space for all the stuff we would take to the air show, so we need more baggage space to go along with six seats. So we've increased the baggage space, we've increased the size of the windows, we've increased the aisle width, and it's all coming down to this pretty good package we feel very good about. Some of the things that are important in that are making sure that the spar is now below the, the floor. We've got a nice flat floor. 
we've questioned ourselves many times on that. Not whether or not it's a good idea, whether or not it really, that the numbers all actually line up, but yep, the, you know, all the CAD model looks good. So the, the final design of the, that uh, part of the airplane is all coming together and we'll get into the now sort of the next uh, systems level. Welcome to the Aero News Network, the aviation world's most comprehensive news and information resource. Real-time, 24-7 online, audio, and video programming, where aviation has been getting updated for over a decade. Distributing over 11,000 stories, features, audio, and video programs every year, only ANN covers aviation and aerospace with this much depth, insight, and expertise. Check us out on the web at aero-news.net. With systems, we'll be looking at things, obviously, like the instrument panel. Again, it'll be the Avidine panel that we'll be starting with in the airplane. Landing gear, tire sizes, it'll have gigantic tires on it, something we went round and round on. We're also really happy about, it looks like we'll be saving space for a future BRS parachute. We don't expect the airplane to have a parachute on it when it's certified but that's primarily a timing sort of issue. We're going to, you know, the, the business case is get the airplane into production as fast as possible and put the parachute on when the parachute's ready. But we're going to be working with, with the people at BRS on developing a parachute. So that's another of the system integrations that we'll be working into the airplane. As we get all those systems decisions made and we'll be going through the final design, obviously then we get into the formal certification process that we all end up talking about so much. We still think it's, call it roughly three years, we don't know how fast, we don't know when, we don't know how much, and all those kinds of things that we always say. But it's all feeling pretty good. There aren't any big decisions that we're waiting for that we feel are unknowns now that would change the design significantly or change the schedule significantly. So the, the program is moving forward pretty well. The engineering team that's in place is both in Duluth, Minnesota and in Brunswick, Maine. In terms of Brunswick, the update on that is it's still where we expect to build the airplane. It's a great location. For those of you that haven't been there, you should definitely come up and visit sometime. But it's a great location, great facility, giant building, giant airport, very cooperative community. There are still some missing pieces in terms of getting the last of the financing in place, but we expect that that'll be the place where we'll be producing this airplane.